All right, so welcome everyone to our June uh, educational meeting, our kind of more in-depth meetings on different topics that we like to do once a month. This is our first time doing it on a Friday, and I personally think there's a lot of good reasons to do it during the week, but I also have to say for me, me it feels a little bit hectic. Um, because there's a lot happening here at Rogue right now. Friday is one of our busier days where we have two classes going on at the same time most of the time. And so I'll probably keep looking. We have days like Tuesday, Thursdays tend to be a little bit quieter around here. So next month, don't be surprised if our meeting is on a Thursday, because then it will feel a little bit less busy for me to come in here and do it. But I'm excited to do it during the week and have everybody open up their Saturdays a little bit more, including me. So this month's topic is continuing with exercise as medicine for people with Parkinson's and focusing a little bit more on skilled exercise. So the first time we did the meeting, my intention was to kind of talk about everything about exercise and how it can be like medicine um, and is so, so important for health. But I found there's so much research in aerobic exercise that we really mostly just covered aerobic exercise and didn't get to this whole other kind of category of exercise that is skilled. So I thought, well, that would be a great thing um, to build on is kind of talk about all the skilled exercise we do, which is very, very important. Let's see. Okay. So when people ask me what type of exercise is important for people with Parkinson's, I'd say the research basically is um, kind of showing like it's emerging that there are two main types of exercise that are very important for people with Parkinson's to do. And it's honestly probably true of everyone. Um, any human probably needs some of both of these types of exercise. And it's certainly what professional athletes do. It's what's important for older adults, young adults, everyone. So those two main categories are aerobic exercise and skill, excuse me, skill-based exercise. So aerobic exercise is anything where you get your heart rate up. And there's a spectrum of aerobic exercise um, from something like, you know, riding a bike, getting your heart rate up, riding like a stationary bike, which maybe doesn't have a ton of skill to it compared to boxing classes that can be aerobic, but also are very skilled. So this is not a complete dichotomy. There's definitely a spectrum and there can be overlap. And that's some of the most efficient exercise that you can do is that when it's both aerobic and skilled, um, things like walking on a treadmill can be both definitely can be aerobic and then also can be skilled if we're working on things like posture and taking long steps and letting the arm swing and working on balance. So there are things that can really overlap um, with each other and, you know, how skilled that is kind of depends on the person. So some people can walk on a treadmill at a fast speed and not be paying any attention to what they're doing. It's very automatic. So that's more aerobic, not as skilled. Whereas um, for people with Parkinson's, since walking is one of the things that is, you know, I would say almost everyone with Parkinson's will experience some change in their walking at some point in time, different amounts for different people and in slightly different ways, but pretty much everybody experiences a change. So if someone has more difficulty with walking, then when they come onto a treadmill, a treadmill may not be very aerobic at first because they need to work on taking longer steps, bigger steps, having good quality movements. They maybe need to hold on. So walking on a treadmill can be very skilled to start with. And then over time, as someone gets better and they're able to walk faster and take bigger steps, it can become more aerobic. So there's some forms of exercise that are more one or the other, or it really just depends on the person. And that's why we talk so much about measuring heart rate is because the research really shows that it's important to work above 60% heart rate max. And so we want to make sure people are doing that um, or as close as possible to doing that. So aerobic exercise is kind of one category. And that's where in our um, meeting in January, I talked a lot about that research. And that's really the research that has the most or that's the exercise that has the most research to support it really influencing Parkinson's progression over time. So I feel very, very strongly about how important it is to do aerobic exercise, but then skilled exercise is just as important. The truth is they're both very important. We need to be doing both. And why is if you see this cool figure here, so exercise, it shows kind of the two main types. Goal-directed motor learning is kind of the fancy way of saying skilled exercise. It's anytime you're trying to learn how to do something better. So examples even from earlier in your life are if you ever learned to play a sport, if you play golf or tennis, um, if you play an instrument or have learned a, a, another language other than English or other than whatever your first language is, then 
that's a learning process. So when you first start, it's awkward. It's hard. You have to think about it a lot, but the more you practice, the better you get. And at a certain point, ideally it becomes automatic. So it depends on how much you practice, whether you get to the point where you're automatic. I learned multiple languages when I was younger. I did not practice enough. It never became automatic. Same thing with instruments. I played a lot of instruments. I got okay at them, but never that great because I didn't practice very much. I did not like to practice. So how often you do these skilled exercises really matters as well. If you do something skilled one time a week, you may not really develop that skill. It may always require cognition. It may always be challenging. So frequency of practice is really important. So skilled exercise and then aerobic exercise. And the way these two forms of exercise work together is aerobic exercise really focuses on brain health. So it increases trophic factors, blood flow to the brain. It improves the immune system. And part of what's going on with Parkinson's is inflammation um, and some problems potentially with the immune system. So exercise helps with that. Neurogenesis is actually building new neurons and neural connections in the brain and then improved metabolism. So that's where you may have heard, you know, there's problems with kind of the um, garbage disposal machine in the cells of the brain with Parkinson's and it's the cells aren't getting out those misfolded proteins. And so that's what exercise can really help um, get those misfolded alpha synuclein proteins out of the cells. And so that's where it's really hard to say the benefits of exercise. It is not just from creating more dopamine. That is one good benefit, but there are probably tens to hundreds of things happening when you exercise that are positive for the brain and body. It's just, there's so, so many things happening. Um, then when it comes to goal-directed exercise, we may see a little bit more of changes here in terms of synapses and how those neurons are connecting together. Both of these um, benefits then build together to create improved circuitry in the brain. So the basal ganglia has better circuitry. That's kind of the blood is flowing to the areas that need it. It has the oxygen and nutrients to support functioning at high levels. And then when you practice something over and over, you're building those new neural connections. And that's what you hear, like, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together, or um, use it or lose it. So there, in our brain, anything that we do, talking, walking, balancing their circuitry in our brain, different parts of the brain are connected through the neurons. And so they can do like functional MRI and see, okay, when someone's writing with their hand, what part of the brain lights up? And when someone is speaking, what part of the brain lights up? And there's usually kind of multiple different areas with speaking. There is a language center in our brain. And there also is kind of the motor production part that's in our motor cortex. So everything we do has circuitry. And if that, that circuitry can go a little bit haywire, with different diagnoses, like with Parkinson's, part of that circuitry could be interrupted or not functioning at its best. And if you basically, um, I don't know what the right word is, so that circuitry isn't going well. So let's say walking has gotten harder and you just think walking is harder. I don't think I can do that. So you walk less and less over time. You don't kind of push back against that change. Over time, your walking will continue to get worse because those circuits in the brain will get weaker and weaker and your actual muscles will get weaker over time if you're not doing that activity. Whereas if you say walking has gotten harder, therefore I need to work on that to build that skill and develop it. So I'm going to make sure to walk every day. I'm going to walk around my house for periods of time. I'm going to leave my house and walk in the neighborhood. I'm going to walk on a treadmill. I'm going to do as much walking as possible and get in as many steps as possible. The more movement and walking you do, the stronger those circuits and connections are going to be. And you are going to maintain that skill over the long term. Uh, with, for people with Parkinson's, the historically what has been expected is that people are diagnosed. First 10 years aren't too bad, but there is progression. And then there continues to be more and more progression. Activities and movement gets harder and harder. And at some point, people might need to use a wheelchair or might need assistance for movement. Well, guess what? If we say we know what things are hard, we're going to keep working on those things. Maybe that doesn't have to be true. Maybe we can keep that circuitry strong, keep your brain producing all of the neurotransmitters that you need and maintain those skills for your entire lifespan. Whether you've had Parkinson's for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, I know quite a few people who have had Parkinson's a long time, decades, 
over 20 years. Right now in our cardio class, there's a gentleman who's had Parkinson's for 27 years and he was on the elliptical first and was getting on a treadmill as soon as there was one that was available. So there are you know, specific examples of individuals. John Ball is a marathon runner. He's had Parkinson's close to 30 years now, I believe, and he's in his 70s and he still runs. So there are examples of people who are maintaining skills that they are not supposed, they're not expected to maintain while living with Parkinson's for so long. And when you look at what they do differently, it's usually that they're exercising. That is the difference. Whereas, you know, when you talk to people who aren't doing well, you know, what are they doing for exercise? Mm, not that much. And they're certainly not pushing back against those things that are hard. So um, the circuitry improves and then that can change behavior. So both your movements, conscious and automatic. So is your, you know, movement, we kind of have two main ways that we move. One is if we decide like, I'm going to walk into the other room and I'm going to grab that cup and I'm going to drink a glass of water. Or there's things about our movements that are very automatic. Like walking is not something that we typically think about each step that we take. We just say, I'm going to the other room and our legs take us there. So um, we need to kind of work on both of those types of movements. We need to practice doing things in a conscious, effortful way. And then basically we need to practice things enough so that they stay automatic, become automatic, um, or get more automatic over time. So a really good example is step length. So people with Parkinson's, one of the earliest things that tends to happen is that steps shorten up a little bit. And that can be very subtle where you don't even realize that they're shorter, doesn't feel any different to you, but maybe you've just noticed that you're a little bit slower than your spouse or, you know, people who you used to walk with. And it might be your actual cadence might be a little bit slower, but one of the first things that happens usually is people's steps get a little bit shorter. And and so you may feel like I'm just a little bit slower. Something's different, but you don't realize what it is. And so that's one of the things that is really important to work on because it's it's across the board. Almost everybody experiences some change there, but you don't necessarily feel it. So then what we have to train you to do is to take bigger steps than what feels comfortable. And if you only practice doing that some of the time or, you know, maybe once or a couple of times in the week, it's probably not going to become automatic and you're going to have to think about it. A lot of the time, longer steps, stretch out, get my heel down first. But if you practice enough, it can become more automatic. And then it's much easier, obviously, to do everything you want to do if you don't have to think about your steps. Um, also, all this exercise can really, it really improves the cognitive circuits of the brain. So the contribution from aerobic exercise is increased blood flow and really helps um, the brain be healthier overall. And then when you work on skilled exercise, you are problem solving. So you're learning to do new and different things. So when we're in a power moves class, yes, we have the power moves that we do in very similarly from one class to the next, but then we also add in new exercises every time. So the skill of that is watching what we're doing, following along and doing it, doing it as big as you can, trying new things, adding weights, adding resistance, you know, changing up what we do. So that skilled part, the way it affects your cognition is that you have to pay attention. You have to focus on what the instructor is doing, try to follow along. Maybe it's going a little bit faster than what is comfortable for you. Maybe it's a movement you've never done before, but by exposing yourself to those new and different things, that's where we're challenging our cognition. And so you might even notice that sometimes you might feel like, wow, this is really hard. It's hard to just pay attention or I start class and then I kind of lose interest. That is your attention and attention as a cognitive still skill is extremely important for living your life. And so those, I mean, there are just so many things that we can work that you maybe have never realized that that is cognitive work to follow along what we're doing and how we're doing it and learn new things and then get better and better at them over time. Um, and in our other classes too, online and in person, boxing is very skilled um, and our high intensity as well. And I'll talk about this, those a little bit more later. Um, behavior too. So mood and motivation. There's lots of research that shows that this kind of exercise also does help your mood feel better. If you have anxiety, if you put yourself in these challenging situations with exercise, again, both aerobic exercise can really help with mood, anxiety, and depression. But also if you put yourself in situations where you're having to, you know, work through a challenge and 
face, you know, something that is challenging for you, the more you do that, the better you get at handling emotions. So it's not necessarily that your anxiety goes away completely, but because you're strong and fit and you put yourself in challenging situations all the time, you're more likely to be able to handle that when anxiety comes up. Um, so the, you know, these three main things are kind of the name of the game, like the better we can get you moving, thinking cognitively and affecting mood. That's those alone are going to have a huge impact on your quality of life while living with Parkinson's. So that's why these two main forms of exercise are very synergistic and very important to do. So just to review aerobic exercise from last time, if you didn't watch the um, lecture in January, I highly recommend you do. This is a movement dis disorders neurologist who said that there is evidence for a direct brain effect to slow Parkinson's disease progression with aerobic exercise. And this is another review article that just talked about all the potential motor and non-motor targets of aerobic exercise, improvement of cardiovascular system, prevention of any cardiovascular complications, um, improving bone health and density, improving cognitive function, prevention or reducing depression, improved sleep, decreased constipation, decreased fatigue, improved functional motor performance, improved drug, drug efficacy and an optimization of the dopaminergic system. So this is just with doing pretty simple aerobic exercise. All of these are potential benefits. So that's why we feel so strongly and why we have the cardio classes both online and in person. And I know for cardio classes online, not everybody has a piece of equipment at home because those are the ones we use treadmills and bikes. That's one of the best ways to get sustained aerobic exercise. You certainly can go for walks outside and things like that. Um, but I would highly recommend as things start to open up as COVID gets a little bit more under control and it's safe to exercise in other places. If you have historically gone to a gym or you have access to a bike or a treadmill, even if you haven't used our cardio classes yet, I would highly recommend that you try them, you know, using a piece of equipment that you have access to because this type of exercise is so, so important. And I feel like it's just the workhorse of exercise for people with Parkinson's. It's not sexy like boxing or dancing or other things can be, but it's probably the type of exercise that's gonna have the single biggest impact on progression over time. So it's a must do. But that's not what we're talking about today. You may be, you may think like, oh, she's just going to talk about aerobic exercise, but no, we're moving on. So I did mention though, how some forms of exercise can really be both aerobic exercise and skill. So here's one example of Dennis walking on the treadmill. When he first started back in 2013, he had a lot of fascinating and freezing. His steps would get short and fast and he wouldn't be able to control them. So yes, walking on the treadmill, our goal is to get the heart rate up. Um, it's a good way to do aerobic exercise, but especially for Dennis, it was really important for him to work on the skill of walking. And there's more evidence that has come out recently um, in some other di in another diagnosis, but basically they were talking about how treadmill is so good because that consistent pacing is so good for the brain to experience. So when you're walking outside over ground, you're probably going faster, slower at different times. The treadmill imparts this very consistent speed for you to work on. And that is such good information for the brain to get. And you can hold on to work on long steps and you can see how Dennis has improved in this skill. If he was just doing aerobic exercise and his brain wasn't learning to walk and move differently, he would still need to hold on and he would be working through that fascinating all the time. But for Dennis, it took a few months, about four months of walking on the treadmill until he stopped having that fascinating. So it, this is, you have to take time to really, skill takes time to develop. You're not necessarily gonna notice a change in your walking or other skills if you're practicing too infrequently, or if you only have practiced for a week or two, you may not notice a lot of change. It can take time, but this is all the practice he did walking on the treadmill three times a week for 40 minutes. He changed the circuitry in his brain so that his walking got better. So he could walk with longer steps more consistently. He could take his hands off. He can turn his head. His balance is so much better. Here he's really got like a death grip on the treadmill. Um, and the cool thing actually with Dennis also in terms of the treadmill coming back from COVID and him getting back on the treadmill, he is actually walking faster on the treadmill now than he has ever walked on the treadmill for the almost 10 years that I have known him. 
So even coming off COVID and the challenges, he has really been pushing the intensity levels. We've been doing the intervals and he's now walking 3.0 miles per hour, which like in 2019, he was kind of in the 2.4, 2.5 mile per hour range. So this is super cool to see, you know, he's had Parkinson's longer. He's had Parkinson's 20 years now, and he continues to be able to improve and do new and different things. And then it also translates to overground. So all the training he's done on the treadmill has helped him walk better over ground. And certainly walking outside for exercise is one of my favorite things for people to do. Um, it's great to be outside in the environment, get fresh air. Um, but just walking outside and walking in the treadmill are different, especially when it comes to the skilled piece. And for some people like walking outside for Dennis, it would be harder for him to get his heart rate up walking outside. There's so many more variables, obstacles, people, distraction, um, whereas on the treadmill, he can really push it and hold on if and when he needs to. So that's, you know, everybody kind of needs a slight tweak for their plan um, to really optimize things. And that's where if you're not sure really exactly what you should be doing or how you should be doing it, and you need more individual guidance. That's where you can meet with Emily and have a one on one visit for her to help you and say, well, you know, what exactly do you want to be able to do better or differently? What do you have access to um, in terms of, you know, pieces of equipment and help you put together that program? So you're really getting the most out of your exercise plan. Um, so aerobic exercise is super important. This article though, was really cool talking about how motor cognitive approach that's talking about skilled exercise and aerobic exercise and how they are really synergistic and how you really need both to get the most out of a program. And that's why I think historically physical therapy itself has not been super effective for people is because they were not necessarily doing the aerobic exercise component. And so if you're going into physical therapy and working on strength and balance and movement and posture, but you're not really seeing a carryover from that exercise, my guess is that it's because there may not be enough aerobic exercise along with that skilled exercise. And same thing, like for anyone who's doing mostly power moves, the power moves exercises are great. They do not tend to be very aerobic for most people that we might get our heart rate up during certain sections of class, but we're not really getting it up and sustaining that throughout class. It's more moderate intensity for most of our members. Um, there may be some people who are working super hard to do power moves, but most people it's moderate. So also if you are doing just power moves exercises, I don't think you're going to have as much benefit as if you figure out a way that you can be getting in that aerobic exercise, whether it's walking outside or getting a treadmill and walking on it or a bike, there's lots of different options, but you really ideally need to be doing both to experience the most improvement and the most change. So they're saying here that it's aerobic exercise that really promotes neural rearrangements and improves cognitions for people with Parkinson's. The goal-based practice with aerobic exercise seems to provide sustained clinical benefit rather than conventional physical therapy alone. So this is, and this is where we can really, both types of exercise working together is we can, where we can really see that neuroplasticity occur and the brain really function better. So it's true in terms of the optimal parameters for intensity, frequency, duration, we don't have all the answers in research right now. What we mostly know is that more is better. And so we essentially want to fit in as much as possible. And we want variety. Um, and we want to make sure that you're doing the things that are right for you based on the areas that you want to improve in. So it is, you know, our membership online and in person can provide a lot, like a lot of those opportunities and the type of exercise to do. But sometimes you do really need that one on one to make sure you're doing the right things. You know, if you've been exercising for a while and you aren't noticing any improvement, that's when you really should schedule one on one visit with Emily to figure out what needs to be tweaked so that you can experience that benefit. So there is another reason that I talked about aerobics so much at the beginning is there's way more research into aerobic exercise than there is for skill-based exercise. And part of that is that aerobic exercise is so much easier to define and to, um, you know, actually get people to do essentially an aerobic exercise is a little bit more um, kind of straightforward. It's like the main parameter is getting the heart rate up and then you can do it in a whole bunch of different ways, but it's easy to say, okay, we're going to use the treadmill or we're going to use a bike. And there's a lot less kind of complicating factors for aerobic exercise than for skill-based. So with skill-based exercise, there are a whole bunch of different types of skills we might want to be working on. Different people need different types of exercises and need to work on different skills. 
So when it comes to a research study, like you really need to be as concise and simple as possible. So aerobic exercise, easy. We're going to do a bike. We're going to have people exercise three days a week. Our goal is to get people above 60 um, percent heart rate max. And we're going to work on pedaling faster because evidence has shown that to be beneficial. When it comes to like improving people's balance, there are multiple different systems that contribute to impairment in the balance system. Different people may experience different changes. Some people may notice difficulty standing still for their balance. Some people may notice more difficulty when they're moving. Some people notice more difficulty when they're moving their head. So if you want to improve balance for people with Parkinson's, there are so many different things to work on. And so that's really the problem and the reason that there's not as much research. There is research, but there's not as much about skill-based exercise is because there's so many different factors that need to be taken into consideration. So it makes it really hard to do research. And then sometimes it's a little bit harder to measure changes in balance. And it's not something that can be applied to everyone in the same way. Research really needs a protocol. You know, here's the exercise that's going to be administered in this way. This is how it's progressed. And that basically is impossible to do with skill-based exercise because how each person is going to progress is different. And what we need to work on to optimize it for each person is different. So that really makes it harder. We don't have as much research to guide us. Um, in terms of these things. And so that's what as physical therapists, so this is what our training is in. So we can figure out what needs to be worked on and how it needs to be worked on. But I would say there's a little bit more of an art um, to kind of the skill-based side of things. There is science, but there's not as much defined, like do these exact exercises in this exact order, progress this way. It doesn't work quite like that for skilled exercise. So what are the kind of skills that we're talking about? Um, so with Parkinson's, there can be slowness of movement. Bradykinesia is one of the symptoms that is essentially required to receive a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Bradykinesia or slowness of movement may be very subtle for some people. They're just moving a little bit slower than they used to, or for some people, it can be very pronounced. So that's one thing because we know, like if you go to stand up from a chair and you do it slower, you basically don't have the right timing to have momentum to get your weight forward on your feet and be able to stand up easier. So like if I move slower to stand up, I basically can't do it. And I don't, I feel like I can't stand up from a chair. And maybe the only problem is the speed of movement. If we just get someone moving faster, maybe they get that momentum forward over their feet and they're able to stand up no problem. So speed of movement is one of the things that we're looking at as kind of a skill. And it's a little bit hard to define. There's all kind of different things that we're looking at. So that's what the way I think about it, I kind of put them all into this category of skill that you can improve the speed that you move at if you practice those kinds of things. Uh, and then hypokinesia. So hypokinesia is smaller movements, also a symptom of Parkinson's. And again, if your movements are small, they're going to affect every single thing you do. If you go to reach for a glass of water, and you move a little too small or too slow, you're not going to get quite to that glass of water. And you're going to be like, what's going on? Why can't I do that thing that I've always been able to do? And it could be sort of as simple as those two things. Um, same thing again, standing up from a chair. If you don't shift your weight forward enough, you're not going to be able to stand up. You have to get your weight from your hips onto your feet to stand up. So in a way it's complex and in a way it's kind of simple. Um, rigidity, another symptom of Parkinson's. So muscle stiffness. So I consider this a, a skill because you can learn to move more fluidly and move better and you can decrease rigidity in your muscles through X. I mean, it makes, it kind of makes sense. Like you have stiffness in your muscles. If you learn to move differently and exercise in a certain way, you can reduce that stiffness. And then kind of these things can contribute to changes in functional mobility. So functional mobility is things like getting in and out of bed, in and out of cars, down to the floor and back up, standing up from a chair, moving around in your home, kind of those activity-based things. And again, if you're stiff, just if you're stiff, it's going to be harder to do these things. If your movements are smaller, it's going to be hard to do these things. If your movements are slower, it's going to be hard to do all these things. Um, or sometimes it might be if you do something simple, your movement speed is okay, but with functional mobility, it's more complex. And so once something becomes more complex, you start to slow down. So these are like really kind of the skills that we talk about, but all of these things contribute. Posture. So for most people with Parkinson's, there is a change in posture, a little bit more of a flexed posture. And 
you know, having a little bit of a flexed posture isn't the end of the world. Um, you can function just fine. But if you notice that it causes you to have back pain because you're flexed forward and now your muscles are having to work a lot harder, if it contributes to back pain, that's a problem. If it contributes to difficulty reaching up overhead to get the things you want to out of the cupboard because your posture is forward and now you have limited range of motion in your shoulders, that's going to be a problem. So posture, it also can affect your balance. So if your posture is a little bit forward, then you may be a little bit off balance all the time and not really able to take steps to keep your balance the way you need to. I was also talking about walking and how for pretty much everyone, walking is affected to some degree. And so even if it's subtle, we want to improve that and have you experience the least amount of change of your, in your walking as possible. Uh, turning. Turning is one of the things for most people early on can change. And so at home, research has been done. Someone wore a GoPro um, at home and they counted how many times that person turned during the day. And it was thousands of times. So yes, it's great to work on walking outside in straight lines, but the truth is that's not right how you move around your house. So moving around the house is more short distance for forward walking and then a lot of turning all the time. So turning is really important to work on. Turning is also a situation where some people are at increased risk of having a fall. If their feet kind of get caught on each other, or don't move well, um, then you know, then they can have a fall or lose their balance. Um, and so we really want to work on that balance itself is a skill. And so, like I said, there's multiple systems that contribute to balance and balance can impact people in all different ways. Sometimes it's more, like I said, being still static balance. Sometimes it's more with movement. Sometimes it's in specific situations. So all of those are things that we're looking at and working on coordination between upper and lower body that may present with changes in arm swing when you're walking or um, again like getting in and out of a car or moving in bed requires coordination of the upper and lower body for what you're doing and that can be impacted strength um, parkinson's does not cause weakness directly but if you're not using your muscles in the same way that can cause them to get weak over time um, and so, and strength is just something that is a skill that often changes with aging. It doesn't have to, and it shouldn't, um, but it's pretty common for people to get weaker over time as they age, most likely more due to changes in activity and not being as active or doing as much. Um, and strength is a really important skill to maintain. You need to be able to push yourself up from the ground and move around in bed. And all these kinds of activity things are a combination of how quickly you're moving, how big you're moving, how strong you are, how flexible you are. All of these are really like multiple skills all put together is how we actually function in the real world. And so this is the perspective. These are not things that you necessarily need to be thinking about all the time. That's our job as physical therapists is to think about what can Parkinson's affect and therefore how do we need to work on it within our exercise classes. And part of the problem too, is if we list all these things out and then we say, okay, we're going to do a set of exercises for each one. Then you have like 12, how many is that? Eight, 11, you have 11 different sets of exercises to do. And that is ridiculous. Like that is not uh, a fever. That's big. So we are trying to be very efficient with our skill-based exercise and work on multiple things all at the same time and hopefully work on it in a way where you don't even have to think about what you're working on. We're always working on balance and turning and walking and moving faster and bigger. And you can just follow along in class and hopefully enjoy what you're doing and actually be working on all these things at the same time. So I really don't like it how you'll see a lot of places they'll divide exercise into you know, like aerobic strength, flexibility, and balance. I don't like that because that's not how we use those skills in our real life. We use all of those things in combination. Like you don't need to just be able to stand on one leg better and just work on that, but you do need to be able to balance on one leg to reach and grab something or to, as you're walking, you know, most of your walking cycle is standing on only one leg or the other. So you need to be strong in that leg. You need to have good balance, but I really do not like the way that exercises are kind of separated out into these different categories, because that's not realistic for how we use all these skills in real life. Um, and that's why we don't separate it out like that. But I think for a lot of people, it makes more sense in their head to say, okay, I'm doing my flexibility exercises or my balance exercises or my strength exercises. It makes sense to us to kind of categorize it that way, but it's not really how we use it. I don't think it's what works um, for people with Parkinson's. 
So how do we work on all these skills as efficiently as possible? So you don't have 12 different sets of exercises that you need to do and you're not exercising for five hours a day trying to fit it all in. We wanna be as efficient as possible with our exercise. So we're gonna start with amplitude. It has been shown, so amplitude is working on moving bigger. And when it comes to people with Parkinson's, it has been shown that that's kind of the core skill that needs to be worked on and when be, needs to be worked on. When you work on moving bigger, you also help all these other things. So when you work on moving bigger, you also work, you move faster. When you work on moving bigger, you work on activating the right muscles and learning to turn off muscles that shouldn't be active and you can reduce rigidity. When you work on moving bigger, it's easier to get in and out of a car. That's part of the main thing you have to practice is really exaggerating those movements. When you work on moving bigger, your posture is better. When you work on taking bigger steps, your walking is more natural. If you exaggerate your steps and make them bigger when turning, your turning is better. So amplitude is the core thing that as someone with Parkinson's, you need to be working on. No matter what you're doing, you need to work on doing it bigger. And then all these other things are going to start to fall into place. And then of course, we'll work on some of these things specifically as well. But moving bigger basically accomplishes almost all of this at once. Um, and then we want to pick exercises that work on multiple skills at the same time as well. So this is just that research study from Becky Farley from the Power Gym that if people with Parkinson's, there's been multiple studies. So if you take someone with Parkinson's and ask them to move faster, they move faster, but smaller. And so walk, that's where walking might be faster, but it's shorter, choppy steps. It's not very smooth. Whereas when you ask someone to move bigger, they move bigger and faster. So that's why we want the bigger movements to be the core of everything we do, no matter if we're dancing or boxing or doing power moves or walking, moving bigger is always the core thing that you want to be thinking about and doing. And this is the study that showed that when people were coached to move bigger, they moved bigger and faster. It's pretty cool. So level one for moving bigger and working on these skills is power moves. I really believe that everyone with Parkinson's should be doing power moves exercises. And honestly, I think even people without Parkinson's should be doing them. We have more and more spouses who are joining our in-person classes, joining online classes. My mom does the classes. She's 70, doesn't have Parkinson's, but says, you know, how much better she feels, how much better she moves, how much better her posture has gotten. Um, the things that change with Parkinson's are the things that often change with aging. It's just that with Parkinson's, they change a little bit faster and maybe in a more pronounced way. But these changes in posture and flexibility and balance are common things for many people to experience. And I, as someone still in my late 30s, do these exercise classes, I am being challenged as well. And I just feel so good doing this exercise too. Um, with Parkinson's, I think it's harder because we are directly trying to counteract the effects of Parkinson's. Parkinson's is telling your body, move slower, move smaller. And we're saying, no, we are going to move bigger and move faster. You can't tell me what to do, Parkinson's. So I think, you know, for all of you with Parkinson's, it is hard work to stretch and move in this way, but it's that kind of hard work that is going to change your brain and change your life over the long term. So level one is power moves, keeping it relatively simple, not actually simple. Power moves classes involve a lot of different movements, positions, new exercises, but we're all kind of moving at more of a moderate, medium pace, um, lots of repetition. We keep some things kind of similar, usually starting and sitting, then going into standing and down on the floor. So there's some structure to the class that kind of helps keep it more level one. Level two is basically taking those same skills that we learn in the power moves and taking them into an even more challenging level, incorporating more aerobic exercise and really working on all these things. So um, these all are appropriate for both of these classes, just so you know, it's not just for level two, but in these types of classes, we do what I, what we consider our skilled classes. So we have our cardio class that is pretty more purely cardio. It's still not purely cardio. There's some skill there, but it's mostly cardio. And then these are our classes that are more skill-based. So in these skilled classes, we are working on movement speed. We are working on movement size. We are working on muscle flexibility and reducing rigidity. We are working on functional mobility, getting into different positions and moving around. We're working on posture. Every single power up we do, we are working on posture. 
We're working on walking, turning, balance, coordination, strength, flexibility, all at once. And you don't have to think like, how am I getting this in or that in? As long as you are participating with us on a regular basis in these classes, you are going to be getting all of this type of exercise that you need. So the power moves, in case anyone hasn't seen this, this, these are the power moves at a glance. And this is what in every single class we do, we do some version of these, maybe not the exact kind of basic power move in each position. Um, but the way the power moves are organized is to take what are the key skills that Parkinson's affects? It affects posture, weight shifting and balance, trunk rotation and flexibility and transitions like our steps or changes between positions. So they're organized. That's why we do a power up in each position to work on posture, a rock to work on balance and weight shifting, a twist to work on trunk rotation and a step to work on those transitions. And then we get into all different positions because that is how we challenge our brain and also our body. So when you're on your stomach, gravity is working on you in a little bit different way. Our posture practice is different if you're on your stomach versus on your back versus on hands and knees or sitting or standing. So we want all that different kind of practice. And then we're also working on flexibility at the same time. And we're working on coordination and movement speed and movement size. So you can kind of see how we're working on everything all at once. And it's a little bit different depending on the position. A lot of strengthening um, in our all fours position. For prone, I'd say it's a lot of flexibility challenge for people getting those hips down and straight through our body. On our back, it's really nice because gravity is actually helping us stretch into that really straight posture. Um, we're not having to work against gravity like we are in most of the positions. So each of these exercises really accomplishes multiple different things all at once. And this is a pretty, just doing the basic power moves, if you did those only, but on a very regular basis, that could accomplish a lot for you. You work on so many different really good things um, in these positions. But in classes, we know for exercise that it is helpful and it's good to do some of the same things all the time, but we also need to incorporate new and different things to keep it interesting. Um, so that is uh, our power moves there. Power up is the, to work on posture. We can counteract rigidity and stooped posture, stretch the flexor muscles and strengthen the extensor muscles. And it helps us improve gait and it allows us to be able to step bigger. The power rock working on weight shifting and balance is necessary to get moving, to turn, to roll and retrains better balance and a wider base of support. The twist is to work on trunk rotation. It reduces rigidity when practiced rhythmically. So that's why all of our power moves, we do lots of repetitions because repetition is important to retrain that circuitry in the brain. And then we also need repetitions because that's how we can get the muscle rigidity to be decreased. That's what research shows is when you do things rhythmically and multiple repetitions, you can reduce, reduce rigidity. And this is this kind of movement is necessary to transition our body through spaces and be able to move much easier and more efficiently. And then our step is super important. That's how we take a step to get going places. So I think the step is kind of the most self-explanatory that stepping is super important to do in all different ways. We want to be able to move to different places, catch our balance. And it's a great way to do strengthening um, and hip flexibility and mobility work as well. So that shows kind of all the skills that we're working on there. Just a reminder in terms of frequency of exercise. So overall with exercise, no matter what types of exercise you're doing, our minimum is kind of three days a week of exercise. And then each additional day is additionally beneficial. When it comes to skill, again, the frequency at which you work on something is going to dictate how much your brain changes. So if you do a power moves class once a week, you probably are not going to notice a lot of change. You might feel better after doing that power moves class, but anything that you're really trying to improve at, you probably need to do a minimum of three times a week. So one way to divide this up would be to say, I'm going to do three days of aerobic exercise and three days of power moves. And that gets you to six days a week. And if you miss a day or two here or there, no worries. If you are really limited on time, then you might need to do more of one of the hit or boxing classes. Those are the classes that kind of can put skill and aerobic together and be a little bit more efficient. So if you really don't have the time to exercise each day, then you have to be very strategic about which exercise you do. Or you have to be a little bit more focused and say, what do I really want to improve on right now, is it, you know, 
things related more to my endurance and aerobic exercise and brain health, or is it a little bit more mobility practice and stretching? You know, maybe you practice, let's say you're doing three to four days a week. You do two days of each, or you do three days of aerobic, one day of power moves. Um, and I think because of that combination, you will likely experience benefits still. Uh, but the power moves, you know, everything we do, the more often you do it, the better you're going to feel. Um, and maybe you just need to do like a short, quick, you know, power moves. Like if the floor ones, I think personally, the floor ones are the most important because it's so different than everything else we do. So maybe you go into the section of the video library that is just the floor routines that are 15 to 20 minutes. And you do that after doing 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three times a week. So it's 45 minutes, three times a week. That's kind of the bare minimum to experience change. But I think that's a, you know, that would be a way to do it that you probably would experience benefit. Just to show some example of skilled exercise, this is Anne. And so this is us like playing around in the gym, trying new and different things. So we saw this on Instagram. She's doing a plank on these moving uh, on the TRX, which can move. She's working on posture, flexibility, breath strengthening, balance. She's working on like all the things that we're trying to work on and doing it beautifully. I also tried to do this and I kind of couldn't really do it. Um, here, strengthening, doing a burpee with that weighted ball. So lifting the weighted ball, strengthening, lifting it up above her head starts to make it more of a postural work and more balance work. So that's where like everything we do, we're trying to work on multiple things all at the same time. Here, balancing to do a plank on that bag, more static balance, also strengthening. Here, doing a burpee with the ropes. Again, a lot of strengthening there to lift those heavy ropes up and jump for a burpee, super tough. So there are many forms of exercise that are shown to improve symptoms. Aerobic exercise is important. You can do things like balance training on its own or strength training on its own. It's just not as efficient as if we put it together like we do in the classes that we do. So all of these things are beneficial. And the more you are working intensely while working on skilled, it's just more efficient. And they're gonna work on different things. So Tai Chi, is I don't think there's really many Tai Chi classes or ways of doing it where it's aerobic. It is very much on the skilled end of the spectrum, um, but you can work on moving big and moving smoothly and working on your balance. So Tai Chi is great. I would say you definitely need to be doing something that is aerobic if Tai Chi is one of the forms of exercise that you enjoy. Same with strength training. Strength training may be getting your heart rate up. You know, if you're lifting heavier weights or using machines, it's good for you to stay strong. My preference would be to do more functional strengthening as opposed to machines um, with weights and movement. Um, that's a little bit more efficient to work on all of those things. Um, but those are all options. And then aerobic exercise, it's great if we can make it skilled as well. And so that's what we're trying to put these together in a way that to make them as efficient as possible for you. So in our power most classes, we move in all the positions. We work on the PD specific skills of posture, balance, trunk rotation, and stepping. We do mobility practice, moving around in each position. And then we work on transitions between the different positions. We add strengthening, extra balance challenges, stretching, and more. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about and incorporating in our high intensity interval training class. That's our, our goal is putting aerobic exercise and skill-based exercise together Together for the most efficient workout. So doing a warm up and then having five stations that are designed to be simple but hard and get your heart rate up. We usually do the same thing like for the whole first round and then we do the same thing for the second round to keep it simple so we can really challenge ourselves. And then we have five stations that are more skill based. We get into different positions, we work on posture, flexibility, balance, posture, all the things. And then have a cool down where we do usually the power moves on the floor so we fit those in. And boxing, same thing. So we have a warm up in boxing, and then we do boxing combinations, which is very skilled, mixed in with the other forms of exercise, ideally getting our heart rate up, working on core in different positions, and then a cool down. So we are really trying to target all of those things that are so important for people with Parkinson's all at once. So, what should you do? To summarize, we are trying to have a goal of exercising as many days of the week as possible, but different. It does not need to be high intensity every single day. You know, each person kind of has difference three days a week, ideally at least of aerobic exercise and possibly a little bit more. Um, and then kind of sprinkling in the more skilled exercise, 
minimum of 30 minutes a day. Ideally, that can be broken up into 10 minute sections, but we don't know if that has the same benefit of increased production of BDNF and dopamine that the longer duration of exercise does. That's the research that has shown that to happen. So I'd say ideally, at least some of your days, you're able to do a longer um, duration variety of types of exercise. That's going to really challenge you cognitively and with regards to all of these skills. Um, variety of intensity. So like I said, we don't want to do intense exercise every single day. We need kind of some fluctuations of intensity. So that's where power moves are great or dancing or Tai Chi or other things that you like to do outside of our membership. Um, totally fine to kind of piece that all together. If you have pain or limitations in balance, that's when you want to see a physical therapist to work on those things, find out what modifications you need or how you need to, what you need to do to reduce that pain so that you can exercise better. And then just a reminder that you need to move bigger and you need to work harder than what feels comfortable. That is where growth happens. Growth does not happen in your comfort zone. All right. So any questions? I know that was... Oh my gosh, it's almost one o'clock. I know that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, I, this was, we recorded this. So if it's something where you want to watch again and maybe pause, you know, watch certain sections, pause, think about things, that's always an option to do. Um, so it'll be up there again. And, you know, I do have a goal of having these meetings only be an hour um, so that it's not quite as much for all of you. And my goal actually is for the content to only be like 40 to 45 minutes and then have more time for questions at the end. But what can I say? There's just, it's so hard for me to, to cut it down. I already did better than I think I've ever done before. I've never fit it all in an hour. Um, and we may also take, like, maybe we take each of these sections balance or strengthening and we have a whole meeting just on that section so with strengthening we are doing a little more heavier weight we've got our hit class with equipment using bands and different things with emily now so we may kind of take these each areas of skill and still take that on its own and kind of break it down and talk about how do we really work on that thing what does that look like in class and what are some of the other things that you might want to do so in future meetings, it's not like this is the only time we're going to talk about it and we're all these skilled exercises and move on. We will continue to talk about these things, you know, as appropriate and balance would be a great one to go a little bit more in depth with, you know, agility and footwork. So that's what I think we will do is kind of take each area of skill that we talked about and have maybe a meeting on each one and break it down a little bit more um, in terms of how we work on it. So I do have a couple of minutes though. If anyone uh, has a question, I am happy to answer those questions. And then also just if you want to kind of let it absorb into your system a little bit, let that information digest and let me know if you have any questions in the future, you can do that as well.